do they have that no other animal on planet Earth has? What do you think? Think about that hard. What do birds have that no other animal on planet Earth has? Yeah. No, they have talons. But talons are also called claws, right? So do other animals on planet Earth have claws? Yeah, lots of them, right? So they do. They, you're absolutely right that they do have talons. But not all birds have talons. Only the birds in prey have talons. So it's only some birds have talons. Okay? This is all birds. This is something all birds have that no other animal on planet Earth has. They do have wings. You're absolutely right. But I want you to think about this. Can you think of an animal that's not a bird that has wings? And then when we think about um, the entire animal kingdom, insects, you know, we always think of insects as just insects, but they're actually part of the animal kingdom. So they also, there's tons of insects that have wings. So that, they, you're right that they do have wings, but it doesn't make them different from any other creature on planet Earth, but you're getting super warm up. What's an animal? Feathers. Feathers, yes. So even the birds that can't fly have feathers. The, um, the, the, the penguins have feathers. Ostriches that can't fly have feathers. All birds have feathers, and that's what makes them unique. Now, what's a bird of prey? What does that mean? What do you think? It is, you know, they do eat a lot of things, but kind of all birds eat a lot of things. Birds are hungry like all the time, so they all eat a lot of things. But birds of prey have something special. Yes? They do eat meat, you're absolutely right, but you know what? There's lots of other birds that are not birds of prey that eat meat. I'm gonna give you a hint, it's how they capture their prey. What do you think? Beaks. Really good answer, but there's lots and lots and lots of birds that have beaks that aren't birds of prey. It's something else. Some birds use their beaks to capture their prey, but not birds of prey. Birds of prey use something else. Um, they capture the prey with their feet? Yes, that's it. If you are a bird of prey, you capture birds with your feet. So I'm going to give you an example. Now, if we're thinking of two birds, let's say a great horned owl and gray blue heron. These are their skulls. Okay. Kind of different, right? Now the gray blue heron uses their beak to capture their food. They spear their food like frogs and fish. But the great horned owl uses its beak like a fork and knife. It doesn't use its beak to capture its prey. What it is going to use are its feet. This is what makes a bird of prey a bird of prey. They capture food. they capture the prey with their feet. Now this is the foot of a great blue heron again. Great blue heron, great, great horn out. The great blue heron is using their feet for something entirely different. Has anybody ever seen a great blue heron in Lake Whitehall? They're all over the place in Lake Whitehall. And they are a bird that stand in water in muck. And these feet are going to help them to stand up in that muck while they're trying to hunt. And they're going to use their beak. The great horned owl up in a tree is going to be looking around and coming down and capturing their prey with their feet. So that is the distinction. That is what makes a bird of prey bird of prey. They capture food with their feet. Okay. Now, we also have, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about the different adaptations that these birds have to help them to find food. Okay, so we're going to get into that in a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about the Blue Hills Trailside Museum and talk about my animal friends here. So the Blue Hills Trailside Museum, part of Mass Audubon, what we do, we're located right at the base of the Blue Hills. So we teach about the natural history of the Blue Hills, but we also take care of a lot of wild animals. But the, the, all these wild animals that we take care of have two things in common. So the first thing that they have in common is that they are all from Massachusetts. So if you came to the museum and you visited with our animals, you could also see the same kind of animals taking a hike in nature in Massachusetts. But the second thing that they have in common 
is that every single one of our animals has had something happen to them so that it makes it impossible for us to let them go back to nature. Um, can, kids, can you think of some things that might have happened to an animal that makes it impossible for us to let them go because it wouldn't be safe for that animal if we let them go? What do you think could happen to some of our animals? What's true?
bite or scratch. Now, is it being mean when you throw it at it? Yeah, and is it being mean if it, if it bit or scratched you? Do you think it's being mean when it does that? Or is it just trying to protect you? It's just trying to protect yourself. Because yeah, it can't talk to you, right? Yeah, and it can't, it's here. The little animal, even if it's a chipmunk, it can't say, hey, wait just a minute. You're awfully big. Could you please put me down? You're scaring me. It can't tell you that with words, right? Yeah, so the only way nice. that it can let you know that it's afraid or scared is by your scratch. Wow. So yeah. we, it's a good idea just to leave animals with their families yeah. in their habitats. <coughs> Um, and I don't know if you've ever noticed, like, on, you know, 
football Sunday, Monday, whatever, and the football players put the dark um, splotches underneath their eyes. They actually got the idea from this printer right here because it prevents glare. And she hunts during the day, and those sideburns help to prevent glare for her. Um, just like all the other birds of prey, and really birds in general, she cannot move her eyes uh, in her sockets. They're fixed in her sockets. So she has to be able to turn her head around just like an owl. Um, and they can go just as far as an owl can, but they tend to more kind of look around like this, where an owl does more of a swivel. Um, she also has really cool nostrils. Um, and the designs of jets today are from the design of her nostrils. She's got, it's called a tubercle, but if she was going into a dive and air was just flowing into her, she would, com she would get completely knocked out. There'd just be too much air going into, into her sinus cavities. Um, but she has this little bony structure that sticks out and kind of lets the air spread out and then go down into her nostrils. So it's not as much pressure, so she's able to maintain those dives. Same thing would happen with planes, they would conk out if they were going too fast when they were coming down. So they also, in their engines, have this projection out in the middle that allows airflow to be spread out um, around the engine. Um, all right, so I'm going to take, um, there you go. Um, that's her call. That's a very typical call of a uh, peregrine falcon. So I'm going to take you for a walk, and then I'm going to tell you a big story about um, the state of uh, uh, peregrine falcons in Massachusetts. But I'd like you to have a, a look. Let's we'll see if she went. All right, you ready to go for a walk? I'm still trying to show me your box. I know you are. So see if you can spot that tomial tooth. It is a notch. Oh, and I'm going to ask that you stay as still as possible um, and not reach out and try to pet my animal friend because she still is a wild animal. You're welcome to take pictures, just no flash, please. Look at that, huh? Isn't that cool? Pretty neat to be on this close to a peregrine pack. And these are some of the, the fastest animals on planet Earth. Isn't that amazing? So she's uh, she's eight. She's eight years old. Now she was living in the wild. She might live in. What's her habitat? Oh, I'm going to talk all about that when I get back because that's an awesome question. And she, what they're doing right now, their new habitat, and they're just. Is there any forest? No, it's something even cooler because it's here in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand, like. Take so 
long time for these guys to raise their young because they're such big birds. You know, it takes a good month before the eggs even hatch. It takes another month before they're even ready to even start to fledge. So they're in the nest for a long time. And the females are staying with those chicks until they are old enough to be able to start flying on their own. And then even then, the chicks are going to hang with the parents probably most of the summer. It's pretty generalized when the birds break. They take a long time to grow up. So I'm just going to scoot up this side. They're similar, it's just a big size difference. Yeah. She's looking around. Isn't she beautiful? So it's kind of interesting that 
some animals are able to adapt around humans and others not, but this one absolutely is. All right, any questions on this bird though before I bring up my next one? Yes? What do you feed it? So we, um, we actually do have um, starlings that we give them. <laughs> we, we purchase them from the food store that uh, we can get for animals that, you know, especially zoological animals. Um, but we give her starlings. And sometimes she gets some mice and rats. You know, we actually do create mice and rats on the on site. Um, that helps us to make sure that they have the species um, and that these guys well, specifically to her, is she still able to hunt like what you give her, even though she can't dive the same? No, so we, we actually, I mean, their enclosures are quite large, but we have like a, a perch that um, we place the food on. Oh, okay. So she doesn't have to hunt. And again, that's another reason why if we let her go, she doesn't have that skill. Okay. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have to take care of her for the rest of her life, is so that she doesn't have that hunting skill. And she wouldn't be able to do it anyway. Yep. Yes, honey. Uh, how come Mr. Kiki doesn't have any eye color? What is that, honey? How come he doesn't have any eye color? Oh, that's really interesting. Now, if I'm really close and looking at her, I can see that she has an iris, but her eyes are very dark brown. And that dark brown is just helping with her whole body color. It helps her to camouflage. And it also helps to cut down on glare. Cool. Yep. Does she have a name? That, excellent question. So we actually don't give names to our animals that we take care of. And the reason is because of one of the lessons that we teach is that you don't take a wild animal and make it your pet. Um, we chose to not give our animals pet names. We just call them by what they are. And this is our female peregrine falcon. Okay. Are there any other uh, nicknames for peregrine falcon? Like, they, you know, do they, are they called something else? Probably. I need, <laughs> I need the Google machine for that one. <laughs> but I, you know, right off the bat, I can say yes, because there are common names. Um, I'm so used to, like, the scientific names, but there's common names that you could be talking about the same animal, and it could have 10 different names depending on what part of the country that you're in. Right. You know? So that would be something that we could do right after we're done. Pigeon hawk. Pigeon hawk. Okay, I'm going to put her back and I will bring up my next friend.
migrate um, down to Texas, Mexico, Central America, South America. And when they do migrate, they congregate into these big giant flocks called kettles. <laughs> now, since she did that, I might be able to take, take her for a walk. Um, I do want to just tell you right off the bat, you might see that her feathers are a little wonky. Um, she just had a trip to the vets. Um, she's got a little infection on her foot, and that made her very unhappy. Um, so when she was being, they have to put blankets around them to kind of calm them down. And she moved a little bit. She kind of broke a couple of her feathers, but no biggie. She's going to shed them, and she'll grow some new ones. But I just, I know you probably wonder what's going on with her feathers right now. Um, so what her story is, is that someone found her when she was a chick. So she had two things happen to her. She got lost from her family. So she was found as a chick, and um, a couple thought they would bring her home and try to make, them, you know, make her a pet. And they were taking care of her for a while, and they realized it was very difficult to take care of a lot inside your house. Um, so what they decided they were going to do is let the animal go. Of course, they let the animal go, and the animal was just hanging around the house. And what was happening was it was being dive bombed by crows. And when she arrived, she had all her feathers missing on her head from all those dive bombs. She was getting pecked, and, um, unfortunately. And, uh, and then he came to us. We're going to take care of her for the rest of her life. So she's a very beautiful. Again, she's a female, so she's about 20% larger than the male. So I'll tell you what, because she just went, I'm going to scoop up. Is it, it, it's usually in a little time in between. <laughs> Ooh, you can go poopy. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go for a walk. Isn't that amazing how much they can poop up? Yeah, I know. Well, I kind of walk this way. <laughs> Now she is a lot smaller than a red tail hawk. The red tail hawks are probably twice the size of her. But watch her head movements. This is the, the thing where they cannot move their eyes, but how they look around, rather than swiveling their head, is these movements like this. Now, um, it's, these guys do live around us. Definitely. Um, it's hard to see them because they're sitting way predators. They'll just get up in a tree and they'll just wait for something to go by that they like, like a mouse or something like that. They're not, they don't soar. These are not the type of hogs that do a lot of soaring. Sit and wait predator. So this is a broadwing hog. But they all have different ways of doing it. So the peregrine falcon is definitely a bird that is actively looking for prey and will dive bomb for them. These are sit and wait predators.
and they're sitting in the tree. All of those colors help them to camouflage. If you'll notice on the birds of prey, none of them are brightly colored. They all have tones, <coughs> browns, grays, blacks, whites. And that is because they are it's helping them to camouflage so they can be very, very efficient predators. Yes. When she did that thing a little bit earlier, what was she doing? So she, sometimes they'll just, they're doing like a, a stretch, but it also helps them to kind of loosen if there's, that would be an activity there, or a maneuver they would do also to just kind of, they have parasites on them to kind of like fluff them off. It's kind of a cleaning mechanism. Too. Yeah. So she's a, she's a big mouse eater, um, and she will also eat, um, one of the things that she really does like to eat is frogs. And this species actually did um, okay uh, during that whole DDT thing because they primarily, their primary food source is, um, uh, is frogs, it's amphibians. And so they, that DDT was not building up in the amphibian population, so they kind of survived that whole thing. <coughs> Um, but that's one of the reasons why they have to migrate too, because they primarily eat amphibians. They do eat mice, but they primarily eat amphibians. Um, it's because all our ponds freeze over. So they have to, birds have to move to find food. That is the whole point of movement. Part of it is to keep themselves warm, but a lot of it has to do with being able to find food. Yeah. Okay. So what differentiates um, a falcon from a hawk? So it's, a, it's the body structures, you know, so the falcon's um, anatomy is quite different um, from the hawk. And if you, even if you look at their wings and how they hold their wings, um, the, the um, peregrine falcon's hawk, its wing comes down like this so that it can pull it in and its body can become almost like a bullet. These guys have big, broad feathers that stick out to help them to be able to fly, especially with the, the red-tailed hawks. They soar, and they need big, strong, wide wings to be able to do that soaring. So it is it, it, how they're shaped, it depends on what kind of food source they're eating. And all those adaptations have to do with, you know, with the climate, with what they're eating, their habitat. Okay, so let's bring her back. And then, So this is a bird of prey, again. This is a 
Ray Bordell. We do have these here in Hopkinton. Uh, they make the classic Buddha <laughs> And on TV, that's more famous for any kind of owl species that's on there because it's the cool suit. But they're the only ones that really do that, that go boom like that. Um, and her adaptations are very different from the other birds and prey that you're going to see. So what's the biggest difference? What do you think between these guys? When do they hunt? When do the other two hunt? When do these guys hunt? Um, the other two hunt during daytime and they hunt during night. Yes, yeah, so these, absolutely. So these guys are nighttime hunters. You can see they do have enormous eyes to help them to see at night. Um, if you come up later, you can also see um, that their skull, this is the size of the skull of this animal. Isn't that amazing? Compared to what it is. But it looks like it's wearing a pair of goggles. This is because if all the birds of prey do have this structure around their eyes, but it's most prominent in uh, the owls. This is called a sclerotic ring. And this sclerotic ring is to help hold in and up these very heavy eyeballs. They're very big compared to their body size. Um, if I were an elf and I were as tall as me, my eyes would be the size of oranges and they would weigh five pounds a piece. It's really, I'd have 10 pounds of eyeballs if I were an elf. Um, so she has got very, very large eyes, but that is not the primary sense that she uses to hunt. Can you think of another sense that she might use to try to find mice in the dark? Yes, what do you think? I'm not sure about this one, but maybe echolocation. So they don't use echolocation. They're not going to put out, put out a sound wave like a bat does and get that information back, but you're getting warm. You're getting warm. Yep. Hearing. Isn't there hearing? Now, you can notice that they don't have these things hanging off the side of their head like we do. These, um, these aren't actually our ears that we hear with. These are our sound collectors. These things hang off the side of our head, collect sound, put it down that hole that's in our head, our ear canal, down to where our eardrum is inside our head. Well, their sound collectors are wrapped around their eyes. If you can see, she's got kind of these dark circles around her eyes. And what they are, that's called their facial ruff. That is stiff feathers that radiate out all around her eyes and down the center um, of her face to create two satellite dishes, if you will. Two bowls of feathers that are collecting sound and putting it into her eardrums, which are just inside that facial ruff. It would be like me going like this. Her eardrums would be right underneath her feathers, or her ear canal, and then her eardrum is in, in her skull, just like ours is. But we can't see her ear canal. The other thing that's really kind of neat about these owls, mm -hmm. I know you're the boss. You're the big boss. Um, is that they have eardrums that are kind of wonky. They've got one facing upward and one facing down. So how do you think that's going to help an owl? Remember, these guys really use their hearing to help them find their prey. So how's that going to help them? In every direction. Okay, so these are adaptations that they have that make them different from the other birds of prey. The crazy eardrums. These sound collectors that are wrapped around their eyes. The other adaptation that they have, and you're welcome to come up and feel the feathers later on these wings, is that owls have the ability to fly silently. And the reason they want to fly silently is because they're hunting at night, they're looking for their prey in the dark, underneath the snow, the leaves in the forest so they're listening it's really important for them to be able to listen for their prey and if they're flapping their wings and making a lot of noise you wouldn't be able to listen for your prey so when they flap their wings they make no noise at all and i'll give a demonstration of that when i uh, put them away but you're welcome to come up and feel just how soft <coughs> their feathers are not on her but on the uh now you also notice that she looks like she's mad like all the time, but actually what that is is just a brow that comes down and it helps, helps to keep things from going into her eyes because this is a bird, a lot of other owls are able to get into tree holes or cavity nesters um, to get out of the rain, get out of the snow, but she is such a large animal she can't do that. 
Um, they don't build their own nests. Um, they have to take over the nests of other birds that have migrated south for the winter. Um, so they'll take over the great blue heron's nest, they'll take over a hawk's nest, um, a crow's nest, and they lay their eggs in February. Um, they hatch kind of late January, early February, and then they hatch in March. Um, it's gonna, you know, the mom has to sit on this nest, again, that's the, the reason for her size, in snowstorms, in sleep storms, and ice. I'm seeing pictures of great horned owl moms sitting on the nest completely covered with snow. Um, so they're good mummies. And they have to sit on that nest a long time. And then these birds, when they finally get old enough to get out of the nest and start hunting for themselves, they still have to spend all summer with their parents learning how to be an owl. They don't disperse until the fall. So these parents invest a lot of time in raising their young. That's why you have a lot of owl calls in the fall, because all the young owls are dispersing. And then you have a lot of owl calls this time of year, because this is, the, this is when they're mating. Yep. All right, you ready? Go for a walk, three girls. This is one. I don't know if everybody heard this one, but did anybody um, hear when I said how much she weighs? No. So does anyone want to guess how much she weighs? Three pounds. So yeah, very close. So she weighs one pounds. Well, I know it seems like it right now, but it's pretty heavy. But she weighs four pounds. But she looks like she would weigh a whole lot more than that. But if you just by looking at that skull, you can tell just how much of this is fluff. The feathers are just fluff, and all of that fluff helps to absorb sound to help them to fly silently. So I'm going to walk very slowly with her. She's a big animal, so um, if you could keep as still as possible with this animal, that would be great.
Want to open up your wings? Busy looking around now. So she's she's panting right now. So that's how they regulate their body temperature, just like a dog does. They'll pant, um, but she'll also do that when she's stressed, and she's a little stressed right now, just a little bit. Not too bad though. Okay, so I'm gonna walk around. Wait, did you get a good picture? Okay, awesome. <laughs> and I'm gonna kind of scoop this one. Orphan, we had the one that was a pet and one that was injured. Yeah. 
she was just an orphan that was found. Um, there were, her siblings were nowhere near her. She could have been picked up by a predator and dropped. She could have been blown out of the nest. Um, and how, so how old? Hmm? How old? So she is uh, eight years old. Yeah. And um, in the wild, they probably would live to about 15, 18 years old. Um, in captivity, she can live well into her 20s. The oldest great horned owl in captivity was 50 years old. That was the um, in the San Diego Zoo, but that's kind of rare. Um, but they're so well cared for. They don't have any predators. If they get sick, they have veterinarians. They're well fed. They, you know, so they tend to live a lot longer when they're in captivity. It's mostly the um, the chicks and the eggs and anything that can climb a tree. So other birds can come by and grab the chicks and grab the eggs. Um, fisher cats can climb trees, foxes can climb trees. So it really is, you know, when they start to fledge and mom and dad start to go off and hunt on, you know, mom starts hunting again, that's when the chicks are most vulnerable. Are there certain owls nearby or I thought the owls Yeah, so she would need about uh, two square miles um, for her territory, um, and for a mated pair, that would be about two square miles. Um, this is a non-migratory bird, so they tend to stay in the same area, so the same mated pair would, would mate over and over again. Um, so the type of owls that we have in Hopkinton, in, in this particular area, are the great horned owls. Um, we also have a lot of barred owls, um, because of all the wetland areas, those are more of a wetland owl, very large owl like herself, um, but not as big as her. Um, and then we have screech owls, and screech owls are very common. They're all the place. That's one of our smallest owls. Um, and they, the, uh, the barred owl needs about a square mile. The screech owls, they only need a, a like, depends on where they are, maybe 75 acres, you know, per, per mated pet. Yep. So do they not tolerate any of their kind in that territory or any owls in that territory or any birds So the, the, that's what you'll hear um, all the calling going on. So their own species, that's what those territorial <coughs> calls will be. They tolerate their offspring uh, in that area for a while, but then they, you know, after, after the fall, that's when it's just kind of gearing up for mating season again, that's when they get very territorial. And those calls are enough to actually move an owl out. There's not like, Skirmishes between owls. But there might be a screech owl in that territory. So screech owls are yeah. one of the prey owls. So screech owls, I mean, but they are. They are in their territory. It's just they, they have to be a little bit careful, quieter. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Do they feed on the ground or do they bring it back to the nest? They, they will bring it back up to the tree. So what, they, what? they don't spend a lot of time on the ground. They come down. They grab the prey and they go right back up to the tree. What can they carry in terms of uh, weight? What can they carry? Um, they can carry um, a lot more than they weigh. Um, so to give you an example, um, uh, skunks, you know, they can weigh about six, six, six pounds, eight pounds, and they're able to take those down. That's one of the uh, few predators of skunks is the great horned owl because they have the ability uh, to, to kill that prey item. And they, birds also don't have a very good sense of smell. So it doesn't, it doesn't bother them. The only birds that do have a great sense of smell are uh, the, the scavengers like the buzzards and the, you know, the, um, the vultures. They have a good sense of smell because they need to. But she does not, so she is a big hunter. Yep. Any other questions?
just going to put her back and then I'll take a, a few more questions. And I'll take it. Is that Yep. All right, so thank 